Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, we shall read a few verses beginning at verse 1. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, reading a few verses. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. May God add his blessing to that short reading from his word. The burden that is on my heart this evening is that of a message on action and obedience. Action and obedience. Action in dealing with all in my life and in your life that stands now contrary to the will of God. And that means God leading me to deal with sin. And uh, obedience to the voice that speaks from heaven. And oh, may heaven's voice be heard in this meeting beyond the voice of mere man. So I take you uh, to that passage just read. And uh, the disciples went and did what Jesus had commanded them. This uh, is a story in the life of Christ that uh, to me speaks of a need and how that need was met by the action and by the obedience of two disciples. How often obedience has opened at our conventions and at other conventions the floodgates of heaven, bringing down upon the gathering the blessing of Almighty God. My prayer is that obedience on my part and upon your part may open the floodgates of glory and flood us with a sense of God that brings conviction, a consciousness that brings a confidence in the God that can deal with sin and with everything in my life and in your life that is contrary to the will of God. Now, let me say, first of all, that we must ever regard obedience as a fundamental condition for blessing, something, a truth that must never be disregarded. Further, let me say this, that uh, there is no moral virtue 
in obedience unless there is a recognition of a higher authority in the one who dictates and calls me to obedience. I want you very clearly to understand that uh, obedience presupposes <coughs> an unreserved yielding to the claims of Jesus Christ. <coughs> I want to underline that because blessing will depend in this meeting upon the measure that I am prepared to listen to the voice that speaks from heaven and obey that voice. You recall when the great apostle Paul found himself prostrate in the presence of God on that Damascus road. What did he pray? What was his reaction to the revelation that came to him? How did he respond to the conviction that something attached to him that could only be explained on the basis of the supernatural? How did he react? Did he say, I wonder if I ought to make a decision? No. That was not his immediate reaction. He cried, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I want to ask now, are we there this evening? Have we come to this convention meeting with a consuming desire to meet with God? If not, our coming is just the laughing stock of devil. Oh, I said that before. I suppose I shall say it again. Have we come to this meeting tonight with purpose and with intention to listen to the voice that Saul of Tarsus listened to? You recognize this? But in that supreme moment, he recognized the condition and bowed before the authority that spoke from heaven. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Mighty blessing will come to men and women in this meeting. A power will be let loose that will shake the very trembling gates of hell. If with purpose and with intention we get to the place that's all God. Lord, I recognize your Lordship. I recognize your supremacy. You're the Almighty One. And I bow in contrition in repentance, in humility, before your voice now speaking. You remember that it is said of Abraham that he obeyed and received an inheritance. You remember that of the disciples it is said they obeyed God rather than man, and went out to turn the world upside down. You see, through obedience, their life became, would I say, a walking incarnation of spiritual energy. And as they moved out to the villages, to the street. Why a power was let loose in them and through them. The 
cause hell itself to tremble. As men and women were swept into the kingdom, I often quote words that I read some little time ago with reference to Socrates. Men of Athens, cry this great philosopher, I hold you in highest esteem and reverence. But I will obey God rather than you. Tell me, friends, are we going to obey God this evening? Let me say again that blessing will depend on how we react to the voice that speaks from heaven. <coughs> now this is a very suggestive passage. Now I want to, to direct your attention, and it must be brief, to three thoughts suggested. First of all, the passage speaks of a need. It also speaks of how that need was met. And what was involved in the obedience that met the need? First of all, the need itself. The Lord has a need. Now here is an expression of need that must be a cause of wonder. Not the God who created the universe and threw worlds into space should ever express a need? Was not the wealth of the world at his disposal? And yet, here we have the Lord of glory the creator of worlds, the sustainer of the universe, giving expression to a need. And I want to say that expression of need has gone ringing down the corridors of time. And I believe that as angels and archangels gaze over the battlements of glory. They whisper, Our God has a need. And I venture to say, as they look upon this gathering, they are wondering if God's need is going to be met. Well, my friend, that depends upon you. It depends upon me. God needing. What is he needing? There is a very arresting word in the prophecy of Isaiah. I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was None to oppose. There you have a cry, a need that has at its very heart a sense of urgency. God looking for a man to stand in the gap. I cannot take time to deal with the gaps, but there are gaps today. And there are gaps that only you and me, in the providence of God, can meet and stand 
for God within them. It is interesting to note that among the, the gifts mentioned in uh, Corinthians, reference is made to the gift of help. God said he looked for a man that would help him to stand in the gap. He couldn't find it. I believe that I am speaking to some here this evening. You may not have the gift of preacher. You may not have the eloquence of a prophet. You may not know the gift that leads you to be a good organizer. But my brother, my sister, you can know the gift of help to stand for God in the place of prayer, to stand for God in the sphere of witness, to stand true to the promises of God and stand upon them. Help. He looked for a man to stand in the gap. Stand for truth. Stand for righteousness. Stand for purity. Stand for power. Stand for all that the church of Jesus Christ ought to stand for in this day and generation. In a world that is rock in a sea of trouble, oh, for men that will stand and stand for God in the gap and cry with the young men of Darius, oh, no surrender, no surrender. Have we been surrendering? Have we been lowering our standards to worldly conformity? Have we been courting the world, the flesh, and the devil? And tonight, God from heaven is saying, I want you to stand for truth. I want you to stand for godliness. Are you standing for godliness? I want you to stand for holiness. I want you to stand by the side of him who came to destroy the works of the devil. Oh, tell me, friend, are the works of the devil being destroyed in your life and in your mind? I believe that God is looking for such men. Well, my heaven cry at this moment. Well, may heaven cry to the faith mission convention in Edinburgh, give me men to match my mountain, give me men to match my plane, men with empires in their purpose, men with era in their brain, give me men to plead for nations, like Elijah on his knees, who in hour of death like stillness wait to cut that heavenly breeze. Give me men of faith and vision, stripped of every earthly gain, till I cross our harsh valley, dark will roll God's clouds of rain. God is seeking that man. Will you be that man tonight? Will you say now, where you're sitting, oh, my dear people, let's get down to reality. We're listening to a sermon. Oh, may God enable us to listen to God. Get out of the field of sentiment. Get into the realm of reality. God is here. And I'm here to do business with God. I'm not here to play at convention. 
I'm not here to play at making decisions. I'm here to meet with God. I'm here to obtain death with. I'm here to honor the crown rights of our Redeemer. My dear people, are we there? Some of us are tired of ordinary things. May God get us into the realm of the extraordinary. I wonder, will you be just that man? And because you have met with God, because sin has been dealt with, because the spirit of repentance has gripped your soul, and you desire above everything else to be right with God, why, you will leave this convention, as I already said, a walking incarnation of spiritual energy that will shake again the trembling gates of the caverns of death. My dear people, are we there? Henry Ward Beecher, that great American preacher, was one time, what is the secret of your wonderful ministry? How is it that you have experienced almost perpetual revival? What is his answer? Did he say my preaching did it? Did he say my organization did it? Did he say the denomination to which I belong did it? He looked his questioner in the face and said, Brother, I have excellent reflectors in the pew. I have excellent reflectors in the pew. That's greater than preaching. That's greater than human organization. Men and women going from this conviction to reflect Jesus. To reflect Jesus. To reflect Jesus. Oh, my brother, my sister, tell me, is that your desire? Is that your consuming ambition? Is that your supreme aspiration? Then I say, action, action. And obedience. And then anything we have. My would be wonderful. My would match out over, wouldn't it? Magic. And perhaps we'll be here till midnight. Amen. Amen. Now that takes me to my next thought. How was the need met? He expressed the need. How was it met? Well, I must be true to the word of God and declare that first of all, it was met by the sovereignty and the foreknowledge of God. God knew that an ass was there. Jesus said, you'll find the ass there. You'll find the ass there. And there's a cult there. And Jesus knew the day and Jesus knew the hour. Don't belittle the foreknowledge and the sovereignty of God in the affairs of man. He knew. I often think of the words of Glover. Every man's life, a plan of God. My brother, my sister, in the foreknowledge of God, God has a plan for you. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't stand in this pulpit. God has a plan for you. But listen, it all depends on your reaction when God puts his plan into your hand. It comes to my mind just now a story I didn't intend telling you, but I feel I ought to. It refers to the great Dr. Zalmer, the leader of 
previous eruption of 1843 when he led that great church out of the wilderness into a life of usefulness for God. Dr. Jarmuth is visiting in the north of Scotland. On this occasion, he spends the night in a certain hotel. After supper, the proprietor of the hotel came to him and said, Dr. Jarmuth, will you conduct family worship? That was their custom. Dr. Jarmuth took the book, read the portion, fell on his knees with the other, the proprietor, his wife, and the guest. Just as he touched the floor, according to his own diary, as he touched the floor, a voice spoke to him and said, Speak to the proprietor. Speak to the proprietor, he's unsaved. Oh, he had family work. He was a good man. You can be a good man unsaved. Natural goodness is in Christian virtue. But another voice spoke at the ear of Jalmer's soul that said, Jalmer, the moment isn't opportune. They're very busy tonight. The number of guests in and others are coming. They're busy. And he listened to the voice of a tempter and went to his bed. At midnight he heard a stir in the house. On coming down to breakfast he was told that the proprietor had died. He tells us that he went back to his room. No breakfast for him that morning. And he knelt by the bedside. And he tells us that the pillow was wet with his tears as he cried. My God, the moment was opportune that I missed it. I missed it. I believe that that was God's moment. I believe that that was God's time. I believe that the Spirit of God was moving. But disobedience on the part of this great man kept back the word that might have meant salvation to the proprietor. Oh, tonight, my friend, if God has a plan, if God has a program, if God brought you to this meeting tonight to have a word with you from heaven, I beg of you, in the interest of your immortal soul, and in the interest of men and women that you will touch tomorrow, and the next day, men that you may influence for good and for God, mercy, and you may help the devil to damn them. Be serious, my dear people, you dare not turn a dead ear. Oh, you dare not. How very solemn, oh, how very solemn are the words found in the book of Ezekiel, Son of Man. I have set thee a watchman to the house of Israel. If thou dost not seek to warn the wicked, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. God needs watchmen. God cries for laborers. God sees that soul that you could influence. But you disobey, and that influence may pass that soul and pass that soul forever. My dear people, God needs you. God needs you. The Lord has a need. Was the talisman on this occasion. I am not for a moment suggesting 
that me must ever be the motivating principle. I'm not suggesting that. I believe that the glory of God, the crown rights of our Redeemer, must ever be the motivating power that drives me to do something at home or abroad. But on this occasion, it's obvious that there was a need. And if there was a need, and there was a need, he expressed it. He expressed it. The Lord have a need. Then I would say tonight that that claim must ever be regarded as paramount. Supreme, beyond everything else. Listen, friends, he has a need in your village. Is it? He has a need in your home. He has a need in the ranks of the faith mission. In the ranks of the mission in Canada, South Africa, France. Oh, the need in the dark places of the earth. In the regions beyond. God has a need. And I want to say because it is made heavenly upon my heart. The that need is paramount, and you disregard it at the peril of your immortal soul, and the peril of the immortal souls of others, trapped in your home, trapped in your home. Just enough, oh, just enough, yes. But that little insignificant animal is serviceable. Have you got that? Is serviceable. And I believe that the hand of God is now touching someone. And someone is saying, well, I can't be a prophet, I can't be a preacher. But I'm building myself to be a helper. Just to be a helper. Oh, I can help someone. And someone will be in the glory because I got the gift of help. My own mother, oh, she loved to go to the prayer meeting. But oh, she could help. And she could help to make the tea at the prayer union annual meeting. And she could help by speaking a word for Jesus. She could help by falling on her knees. You know the night that God saved me? Mary Graham and Jesse Muller were conducting a mission. When I came home that night, mother was on her knees. So oh, she could help. She could help God. I say it reverently. She could help God to touch that son. And God did it. God did it. Oh, can I be of service? Can I be of service now? Can I leave this meeting animated by the conviction that I must help? Well, my friend, if you can serve, if you can be your service, be it in the home, in the village, in the church, in the mission, or across the seas among those dying in darkness, then I say, that should be your honor, that should be your sincere, that should determine your action and your obedience tonight. My time is almost gone. 
What was involved in their obedience? First of all, a recognition of the fact that what was the, what was to meet the need must be loosened. Now this is important. I wish I had an hour to deal with. It must be loosened. Tell me, brother, tell me, sister, what in your life is binding you? Is binding you now? There's a very arresting word in the book of Job. Are the consolations of God small with thee? Is there any secret thing with thee? Tell me, friend, do you live to think lightly of the consolations of God? Isn't it a wonder that you're saved? Were it not for the mercy of God, you might be doomed and damned forever. Keeping company with damned souls and damned spirits in hell. But you fear at this convention of saved souls. Do you think lightly of the consolations of God? Do you think lightly of the fact that God has given you an opportunity to serve him? That God has chosen you to be an, a witness, an ambassador in an alien land. The God has placed that honor upon you. Are the consolations of God, are they light in your eyes? Ah, but there's a double barrel question here that I want to touch. Is there any secret sin with thee? Someone has said that the greatest hindrance to revival is not loose living, but secret sin. Is there any secret <coughs> thing with thee? I want you to face that. It's important. Oh, how many of us are bound. Bound by secret sin. Minister, a prominent minister, at a conference in Oxford some years ago, came to my room and said this to me, with tears swimming from his eyes. I'm living in constant fear that I was under. I'm living in constant fear that I be found out. Now I may be speaking to someone and you're living in constant fear that you'll be found out. Is there any secret thing with thee? My brother, my sister, drag it to the light, for God needs you. Oh, God needs you. God waits to be gracious. I love that passage that I used to speak from frequently, but unfortunately it got into one of my books, the sermon, and uh, I'm somewhat bound about giving it again, but you remember the message that I gave once, some of you will, at this convention. But it says, He that doeth truth cometh to the light. I remember the morning that God gave that verse to me. He that doeth truth comes to the light. He will live no longer under any self-created delusion. He will stand and face truth with unqualified honesty. If there's sin in the camp, am I bound? Am I better? Oh, I didn't mention this sin, that sin or the other sin. You know the sin that is binding you. Is there any secret thing with me? Oh, my brother, you're going to face it tonight, I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded. 
You're going to meet the need tonight. I'm fully persuaded. Ah, but there was another thing involved in the obedience, the recognition of the Lordship of Christ. These are wonderful words. Oh, listen to me. The Lord. The Lord. The Lord of glory. The Lord who conquered death and hell on Calvary. The Lord who cried, It is finished, as the hounds of hell swung back to the caverns of death. Defeated! Defeated! Not Lord. I need that. Are you prepared to recognize this worship? Are you prepared to say tonight, Lord of my life, I crown thee now. Thine will the glory be. Away from man, away from now. His crown right. His crown right, and I bow in reverence, in humility, and my God in the temple. Or perhaps you give expression to the longing of your heart in the words that I now quote. Will you listen to them? Now abdicate my vain self-will. The sector, Lord, is thine. Now reign and with thy spirit fill this yielded heart of mine. Thus sanctified, may I possess the Canaan of true holiness. You see, the need was met by action and by obedience. And your need, oh, your need will be met by action. Are you going to act tonight, you young people? Are you going to act? Are you going to bow before its authority? Are you going to yield beneath its sovereignty? You're going to say, now abdicate my vain desire, the scepter, the scepter, oh my God, the scepter, Lord, is thine. And I make that surrender now. I make it now. You're going to make.